Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Talonghungba. The remains of nine Native American children who died more than a century ago are being returned this week to their tribe. The children, who are all from the Rosebud Lakota, were forced to attend the Carlisle Indian Industrial Boarding School in Pennsylvania. They died between 1880 and 1910. This is the fourth time the remains of children have been returned to their tribes since 2017. Earlier this summer, the remains of an Alaska Aleut child were returned to her tribe. U.S. Interior Secretary Deb Holland attended the ceremony yesterday. Holland recently announced a nationwide investigation into U.S. boarding schools that attempted to assimilate indigenous children into white society. Tribal officials say some of the children will be buried in a veteran cemetery and others are destined for their families' graveyards. Around 60 large wildfires are burning in the Pacific Northwest, threatening tribal lands. Tribes are already struggling to conserve water and protect traditional hunting grounds. Fires in Oregon and Washington state have destroyed homes and burned more than 1,500 square miles, according to the National Interagency Fire Center. Climate change is being blamed for the extremely dry conditions and heat waves that have swept the region, making wildfires harder to fight. North Dakota's seventh annual Indian Education Summit begins today in the capital city. The Bismarck Tribune reports more than 10% of the state's K-12 students are Native American. New legislation will be one of the focuses of the two-day summit. Lawmakers approved a bill requiring schools to include an emphasis on the state's five federally recognized tribal nations. State Representative Ruth Buffalo helped push along the bill. She's enrolled in the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation and is one of the event's featured speakers. Lucy Fredericks, who is Standing Rock Lakota, is the Director of American Indian and Multicultural Education. She says she wants to make sure educators know what sources are available. We also want them to be aware that this information, this culture, this history can be included in every subject area in all grade levels, levels K through 12. And so I think the most important thing that I think um, educators will get out of the summit is that um, we have the resources available for them to use. Some of the 27 breakout topics include school improvement, native languages in classrooms, and supporting the mental health of native youth. The Cherokee Nation Tribal Council in Oklahoma is waiving the tribe's sovereign immunity for a specific purpose. The waiver is to help negotiate detention contracts with county and municipal jails within its reservation. It comes after the Supreme Court ruling in the McGirt case last year, which effectively gave the, tribal, the tribe criminal jurisdiction over natives residing within the reservation. Principal Chief Chuck Hoskins Jr. and other leaders determined the contracts were necessary to ensure public safety on the reservation. In a separate action, the council also okayed a resolution expressly encouraging tribal consultation and representation in the Boy Scouts of America program. The resolution was sent to scout leaders asking them to stop using Native American names without first talking to relevant tribal nations. Olympic surfing is exposing the whitewashed history of the art form that is indigenous to Hawaii. For some Native Hawaiians, surfing's, surf, surfing's Olympic debut is a celebration of a cultural touchstone invented by their ancestors. However, it is also an extension of racial issues tied to the history of the sport and their homeland. The Summer Games in Tokyo, which opened July 23rd, is serving as a stand-in for that unresolved tension and resentment. Native Hawaiians say surfing is being culturally appropriated by white outsiders 
who benefit the most from the $10 billion industry. They view surfing as a spiritual art form and national pastime that connects them to the land and the sea. Carissa Moore is the reigning female world champion and is also the only Olympic surfer who is ethnically Hawaiian. Moore says she is working hard to represent her country and her people. I usually compete under the Hawaii flag all year with the WSL, but um, I'm really like, for me, that's not a huge focus right now. I think that I can still represent both even if I'm not wearing the flag on my sleeve. I'm wearing it on my heart. The Olympic governing body for surfing is pledging during the games to honor Hawaii and Duke Kahanamoku, the godfather of modern surfing. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Coming up, Holly Cook Makaro joins us to talk about crossing the Canadian border. But first, we'll check in with Hi Hawaii Representative Kai Kahili, and we'll be right back. U.S. Representative Kaili Kahele is serving his first term in Congress, representing Hawaii's second district. He is only the second native Hawaiian to be elected to Congress in statehood, and he follows the heels of the late San Senator Daniel Akaka. Kahele is a combat veteran, pilot, and commissioned officer in the Hawaii Air National Guard. He joins us today to discuss the 100th anniversary of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act and its significance. Thank you. Aloha, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, let's start with the big picture on this act and its significance. Uh, last Friday, uh, July 9th, 2021, was the 100th anniversary of the enactment of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920. This was a uh, historic bill and still today remains the most significant piece of federal legislation enacted to advance uh, Native Hawaiians uh, throughout the country. It was championed by uh, the late uh, Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalani Anaole, who in 1920 uh, was Hawaii's second Native Hawaiian to represent Hawaiian Congress. And at that time, Hawaii was still not a state. We we're a United States territory. So he was a non-voting uh, delegate to the Congress. He had uh, uh, been serving for about 18 years at that point in the Congress. Uh, and this was something that he felt uh, was really, really important for Native Hawaiians at the time. The fact that he was able to um, shepherd this piece of legislation through the Congress and bring it to the desk of President Warren G. Harding on July 9th, 1921 for his signature uh, is just a testament to uh, Prince Kuhio's um, advocacy uh, and his ability to compromise um, you know, on, on, a, on a bill that was really important for Native Hawaiians. So much of the communities across uh, really North America, but everywhere, are starting to rethink issues of identity and sovereignty. How, how is that happening in Hawaii? You know, it, it has been a topic of discussion, often uh, 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 heated and spirited discussion in Hawaii for, you know, as long as anyone can remember, um, you know, definitely since uh, 1893, when the Kingdom of Hawaii was illegally overthrown uh, and then the subsequent annexation to the United States in 1898. Um, there was this period in Hawaii during the 1970s uh, when uh, often referred to as the Hawaiian Renaissance or the resurgence of the Hawaiian culture um, that uh, has continued on for the last 40 years. Um, but, you know, Native Americans, Native Alaskans and Native Hawaiians, the indigenous peoples of this country, um, uh, you know, share a mutual um, history, um, somewhat different, but, but often very, very similar uh, in terms of our trust relationship and that uh, relationship with uh, the federal government. You know, Hawaii and Native Hawaiians are still trying to navigate and figure out what is the best path for Native Hawaiians, um, but working together with our Native American, Native Alaskan brothers and sisters, and uh, um, seeing what best practices 
um, can be implemented in Hawaii is something that we are looking uh, forward to and I'm looking forward to very much doing. One seems to me really remarkable shift has been that um, with social media, people on across uh, Turtle Island are connected in ways they haven't been before. And so something that happens in Hawaii is a local issue for people everywhere. It is. Uh, I think one of the best examples of that uh, and a very similar example um, with the Keystone Pipeline and Standing Rock was the 30 meter telescope and Mauna Kea. Um, very, very similar issues uh, that affected the you know, indigenous uh, peoples of that area and that spread like uh, wildfire um, through social media and, and really was an opportunity to, to bring um, culture together around a particular issue um, you know, that, that existed in Hawaii last year. Um, you know, another thing we're seeing in Hawaii and throughout the country is the resurgence of our native languages and um, the, in, the revitalization of those languages in Hawaii. That's something that has been happening for several decades now. And, and the result of it is the reestablishment of the, the native Hawaiian language throughout Hawaii and throughout our communities. And, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing. I understand um, one of the um, challenges post-pandemic is tourism and both the opportunity of tourism and the challenges of tourism. Uh, how do you see that right now? Well, Hawaii is unique. We're, we're, we're still one of the few states in the nation that has not fully reopened because of COVID. Uh, and, um, you know, we still have mandatory quarantines. Uh, if, if you haven't received the vaccination, there's still um, uh, mask uh, requirements in, in many indoor places. And so tourism hasn't fully come back to Hawaii. It typically has always been the economic driver of Hawaii, that along with uh, military spending in Hawaii. But we have to try and find that balance of tourism in the islands, you know, at its peak. Just a year, two years ago, Hawaii was experiencing 10 million visitors to the islands annually. And that has a, um, a big effect on our parks, our natural resources, our, our fisheries, our swimming areas, just the overall um, environment in Hawaii. And so you got to try and find that balance between tourism, the economic um, needs of the state, uh, but how you can also maintain that local Hawaii lifestyle that so much of us love, that laid back lifestyle, um, and also being mindful of the really precious uh, environmental and coastal and natural resources that make Hawaii such a beautiful and unique place. And so it's, it's trying to, to strike that balance um, between those two issues. Part of the challenge for finding that balance, um, the Biden administration has put a lot of resources into climate change and that's something that directly impacts what you're trying to do. How are the discussions going along those lines? They're going great. You know, um, Hawaii and, and the larger Pacific, and you could arguably say all of Oceania, contributes very little to greenhouse gas emissions and, and the uh, um, effects of climate change, but experience the greatest effects of, of uh, the lack of policies that address those issues, you know, because we experience rising sea levels that uh, are affecting uh, small coastal communities and small islands throughout the Pacific. We're starting to experience rising sea, sea level temperatures that have a major impact on our coral reefs and our nearshore fisheries. Um, there's overfishing that has been happening throughout the, the Pacific, um, you know, because of the strong demand for um, the type of Pacific uh, fisheries that, 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 that um, you know, people, people love to have on their, on their dinner plates and on their menus. And so, again, um, the Biden administration is, is, is on the forefront. And I'm a, myself being a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and Chair Peter DeFazio are on the forefront of making sure that these uh, infrastructure bills, appropriations bills, and things that the House uh, is pushing forward uh, addresses climate change and, and, and addresses those impacts. Uh, one of the hats I wear is a commercial airline pilot, and I'm really excited about the potential for sustainable aviation fuel 
uh, that um, you know we can work with our major airlines uh, to to invest in. And of course, the federal government has to put research dollars into that. Uh, but weaning us off of fossil fuels, electrifying our transportation system, investing in charging stations, looking at um, sustainable modes of public transportation, electric buses, hydrogen buses, electric vehicles, um, sustainable av aviation fuels. Those are all steps in the right direction to wean us off fossil fuels and the harmful effects that it does uh, and contributes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and the effects of climate change. I want to ask you about uh, joining a Congress with an indigenous voice, and this is a record year for that. How is that working? Fantastic. You know, we just had a traditional Native Hawaiian blessing of my office here in Washington, D.C., probably one that has never, ever been done here in Washington, D.C. in its history. And uh, it's really important to have Native voices and Indigenous voices here in the Congress at the highest levels of, of, of government. Uh, for me, I walk in the footsteps of great Native Hawaiian leaders and Indigenous leaders and uh, working together with Sharice Davids uh, and other indigenous members of the Congress. I'm looking forward uh, to what we're gonna be able to do here in, in the Congress and throughout the country. Thank you so much, Congressman Kahili. Aloha. And we'll be right back. When journalists go out into the field to report, they sometimes find that the real story differs from their original plan. Usually, the stories that emerge in these situations take on lives of their own and are far richer and more interesting than anything that could have been expected. This is one of those times. During the course of reporting about how artisans build ash baskets, ICT national correspondent Marionette Pember had the great luck to discover a nuanced emotional story about how traditional native crafts and lifeways can enrich and offer healing to those who do this work. I recently traveled to the Bad River Ojibwe Reservation in Wisconsin to explore the art of ash basket making. April Stone of the Bad River Tribe demonstrated the labor-intensive process of pounding strips of bark from an ash log and weaving the strips into baskets. What began as a simple how-to story about the history and craft of basket making, however, grew into a much broader narrative about how traditional life ways can guide and heal our lives. So I made the first basket and then um, I spent the, that, that year then from the spring of 1999 to the summer of 2000 doing nothing but weaving baskets. Now you also made um, a casket I did, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, there was this one grant that I had written um, through the Minnesota Historical Society. So I was, de I was denied that first year that I wrote the grant, but I tried again. And so when I, when I wrote the grant the second time, I um, incorporated a community aspect to it where I would be doing this work in public in downtown Ashland. And for 30 days, I'd open up my studio for the community to come in and work on the casket with me. So if they ever needed to take a break, they could go into the sitting space and uh, relax and just be contemplative, just whatever they needed to do. Um, some people came in and they just, they talked about death. They talked about when they made a coffin for so-and-so and that person died. They remembered when they buried so-and-so. Some people brought in beadwork and just did their own work next to me doing my work. Some people would not come in the door at all. They just stood at the door and looked at me like I was crazy. Like I wasn't just operating on like regular hours. It was when my door was open and the lights were on, come inside. And I had this sign that was made for the sidewalk and it said, me and game, come in. Do you intend to be buried in that cast? No. No. And I was able to make this basket, which was actually an artist statement based on my relationship with how much I love working with ash and the emerald ash borer that's coming through the invasive bug that's killing millions upon millions upon millions of ash trees across the United States. Um, and so that burial basket project was actually representative of the death of black ash and what that means to me. It, it, it was death. Um, and so, so many uncertainties about working with 
being able to work with Black Ash in the future because this is like my passion. This is where I do all of my work. This is like where I've spent the last 20 some years gaining experience, traveling, doing research, um, just trying to really understand uh, Black Ash and its history here around the Great Lakes, in particular Northern Wisconsin, affiliated with my, with my tribe. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out that story. And my studio, my, my rental was up at the end of July. And this was back in 2016. And um, it also happened to be the day that my husband was getting married to his woman, his new wife. <laughs> and they were just getting married like a mile and a half down the road. And I was sitting in this space and I was just crying because uh, this thing that I was making took on an energy, uh, like a presence, and it was very feminine. And it was me and I was grieving the loss of my, my husband, you know, and I, I had to take that coffin out of there and I need to put this away. And I put it away for a year and I didn't touch it because what turned, what started out as an artistic expression turned into a, a, a healing for myself. <laughs> so it was death. It was the death of, it was the artistic death, but it was also the real death. But from that then, a year later came rebirth when I took it out and I put it in the lake and I submerged it and I took it all apart and I rewove it. And um, what took all that time to work on took only 45 minutes to undo. And then I drove it down to the Minnesota Historical Society and it's now in their history center um, on display. On the Bad River Reservation in Wisconsin, Marionette Pember, Indian Country Today. The border between the United States and Canada is still officially closed to most people. However, some with tribal IDs can cross the international border. It's one international policy that's not having too much of an impact on Indian country, but we thought it was interesting. Recently, Holly Cook Makaro crossed the international border. She's a partner with Spirit Art Consulting and is a regular contributor to our news program. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. This is fascinating. So what took you to the border? Uh, my tribe, the Red Lake Nation, has lands in what is known as the Northwest Angle, which you can either cross by, um, I think it's approximately 50 miles of open water through Lake of the Woods, or requires, generally requires passage through Canada to enter. And so I was up there visiting. My father has a land assignment there and a small place that we go up and visit to hunt and fish. It's also the blueberries are, are, are out and uh, swamp tea is out as well. So we went up to gather some of those things. What I love about this is just a very subtle recognition of international sovereignty. Yes, it is actually very interesting that the border has been closed since March of 2020, like when many borders closed around the world. So right now in order for anyone to pass, you have to have a tribal ID and you have to be going for subsistence purposes. And some of those uh, like fishing, hunting, gathering wild rice, gathering medicines, those are non-discretionary purposes um, to enter Canada. And so with a tribal ID and having a passport or other form of identification is also helpful, you, you are able to cross the border. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget today is, uh consulting with tribes. And one of the issues coming up is healthcare funding. Big picture on this OMB consultation is the significance of its mere occurrence. Um, the OMB doesn't, hasn't normally in the past held tribal consultations in spite of previous executive orders, but this is a direct result of President Biden's executive order that was issued very early in his administration requiring consultation with tribal governments. And I understand that the Office of Management and Budget, which is a, an agency within the White House, and it is charged with crafting the president's budget proposals each year, plays a very critical role in the Indian budget process and um, is really the primary drafter of that section. So this consultation is significant. It's also significant because on the agenda, they've asked for input into uh, mandatory funding proposals, options for mandatory funding proposals to make in the Indian Health Service funding um, mandatory. 
which it is discretionary at the moment. So that has long been a, a priority for Indian country and tribal leaders and something that, that we've been asking for. So I'm really glad to see it on the agenda. And this comes really at the same moment as the administration dropped a $3.5 trillion spending bill that has Bernie Sanders cheering them on, <laughs> which was not expected at all. No, and, and his cheering them on is um, a, a key note in the possibility of its passage. So uh, several of the more moderate um, members in the Senate have um, expressed conservative um, optim I wouldn't even say optimism, but they haven't come out in opposition. So I, I always say, well, if they're not screaming no, well, then there's room for growth. And obviously the devil is in the details. We, would all, we all want to see what is actually in there for Indian country in particular. So they are looking obviously at, at the big number. Um, the hard part here is when the rubber hits the road and we see get into the policy details and what those numbers look like for Indian country also. Well, there's a lot to keep watching. Thank you, Holly. Yes, thanks, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Times you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.